I'm Kevin McKernan. I'm going to be speaking about three explosive markets. You guys are all very familiar with crypto, um, perhaps less so with cannabis. The cannabinoid field is exploding, and I'm going to touch on genomics as well. Uh, the genomics field has been going through exponential growth curves, and these things all intersect. When they intersect, there's really, really interesting opportunities. So um, how many people here know the four letters of DNA, just to start? Anyone know? All right, we got a biologist, that's good too. What G A T C are the four letters for those who don't know? A in that equation is actually something known as adenosine. And adenosine uh, is the molecule in ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Okay, so this is an energy source that's required to write the code of life, and it's physically written right into the code of life. All right, so there's a lot we can learn from, from proof of work and from blockchain technologies and how to move information throughout time because biology is teaching us about this. We've got 50,000 cells that all have to run the same six billion code set and somehow they've figured out how to do this and manage mutations. Now, mutations occur and when they occur dramatically, they speciate things and when they speciate things, you get new, new forks, if you will. But oftentimes you get mutations that create cancer. And these mutations are uh, your immune system attacks. And it's kind of sounds familiar to what's going on in the Bitcoin space right now. Small changes people fight heavily over. Large ones, they don't. Uh, we see this in biology as well. So where am I going with this? Uh, in order to get a sense of where I'm going with this, I'm going to give you a little bit of my history, because I think that'll put you on the right trajectory as to what, what we're doing here in this case. So uh, I grew up in a family of, of biotech entrepreneurs. My, my uh, uh, breakfast morning meetings would be uh, with my parents would be about uh, liquid scintillation counters and bioluminescence and finance. And so uh, I kind of got into this groove almost genetically. Uh, and then as that began to mature, I decided not to go to medical school with my, uh, with my pre-med degree at Emory and decided to jump into the biotech space and see what opportunities were there. So I got very fortunate and lucky and got a job on the Human Genome Project at MIT uh, and started working with Eric Lander to manage the scale up of the Human Genome Project. So this was back in around 95 and 96. And uh, shortly into this, the two guys that hired me quit and left me with the reins. And I was 24 and wholly unqualified to be running any research and development team on this project. Um, but fortunately, it, when you're in the right time in the right place, the best and most important thing is to know it. And I started working weekends and nights to keep this thing going uh, and, and, and look to get a PhD. I, I, I applied for a PhD and then deferred, mainly because halfway through this, a private company stepped forward and claimed they were going to sequence the Human Genome Project for a ten less or tenfold less than the government. And the government should go fork off and sequence the mouse genome. Naturally, every scientist with no ego decided to do exactly not that. Uh, they decided to fight, and they decided to have a, a thorough race with this private company because the private company um, was, had a monopoly in actually making the DNA sequencers that they were going to use. And that private company formed, very brilliantly, a competitive entity to the, to the, the, uh, the government-funded genome project called Solera Genomics. And Solera Genomics went about uh, their business sequencing the human genome project, or sequencing the human genome, and their actual vilifying trademark was that they were going to patent 300 of the genes of the human genome. Uh, exclusively for them, and this unnerved a lot of the people on the, uh, in the public project. So, uh, nevertheless, uh, we spent two years designing a $10 million robotic floor that was, uh, you can see in a nature paper, and uh, we ran this for 10 months and had the genome done in, in short time. Uh, this thing got put public, and uh, lo and behold, at the end of this whole episode, ironically, the NIH had more gene patents than Solera. NIH funded this whole thing. So, uh, this left some of us a little disenfranchised because then 20% of the human genome was actually, at least the genes in the human genome, were patented. And that wasn't really the intent of the public project, but it's what actually occurred. So I then jumped into the private sector, started this company called Agincourt, which then moved these genome sequencers out of uh, cities and outside of expensive universities and put them in the back of shopping malls so we could drive the cost down of sequencing and compete. Uh, we got to be about a third of the price of most of the publicly funded genome centers. They invited us in, gave us funding, and this company then became the largest private sequencing company uh, in the world. Uh, we sold this to Beckman Coulter uh, in 2005, and we had a pet project in there to make a genome sequencer that was 100,000 times faster than what ABI had at the time. We had a hard time getting this funding because no one believed those numbers, and they shouldn't have. It was, it was a bit of a ludicrous... Um, uh, proposal, but it actually turned out uh, we spun this company out, and the company that bought us actually put, pitched in 49%, a six million bucks to get 49% of the company. We had 19 people that we spun out, and a year later, ironically, ABI came and bought this company for $120 million and moved it to California. Um, so, ironically, I spent a lot of my life 
competing with applied biosystems, they then came and purchased our company, uh, and then the, this, this thing went to Life Technologies and became a much larger $10 billion company. And after uh, five years of working with them, I decided it was time to get out, but I had a non-compete. I had a non-compete, which meant I had a non-compete with pretty much everybody in the biotech space. Uh, so I did something that none of them would, would approve of, uh, is I quit my job and sequenced the cannabis genome, put it public for everybody, so we could hopefully avoid this patent fight on the genome again. Uh, and that is what brought us into um, this market. Now, I think everyone in this audience understands decentralization and the benefits of it, but they may not realize that another decentralization moment's coming, which is that we're going to be able to read the code of life on USB sticks in a matter of years. All right, so this is very different than what we did in, uh, in what, in how we sequence today. Sequencers today are very centralized. They're million dollar pieces of equipment and you have to put them in laboratories. You need at least five million bucks, maybe 10 million bucks to get into the sequencing space. This is soon going to be a thousand dollar device that can you put on your phone. I have one of them in my backpack over here I can share with you. Uh, we also have these quantitative PCR tools that we use quite a bit and these things are getting scaled down to things that are only 650 bucks. There's one right over there. They've put one on the space station. I travel it with a TSA through the TSA all the time, and we can use these things to decentralize the problem we're facing in cannabis. So the problem with cannabis is it's heavily centralized and that the federal government does not want us to be playing with this yet. They're slowly legalizing it state to state, but you can't move cannabis across state lines, but you can move genomic technology across state lines, and you can populate them in a decentralized manner all over the globe. So how do we do this? How do we make the picks and shovels that can facilitate reading cannabis genomes and actually um, testing cannabis genomes in a way that doesn't require a centralized laboratory. Well, I'm gonna show you how we're doing that. Uh, so we've now been making these PCR tests that run on these little devices, um, and we're using them first and foremost for the things that they're regulating. They're regulating that we test every single pound of cannabis for a handful of microbes that might give you food poisoning. So we've got a system that basically tests for E. coli and salmonella and a variety of other things, but the other things that growers really want are how do you test for the things that kill a plant? Because everyone's growing these very large monocultures and if a pest gets in there, it wipes out a huge grow and there's no crop insurance yet. So uh, we have now a market where we're selling these instruments throughout the, throughout the country and even into Canada and the customer base is growing really nicely and it's mostly around human pathogen um, testing and plant pathogen testing, but there's another little bit happening that's related to, um, to genetic patents that I'm gonna touch on in just a bit. So for those who aren't familiar, you'll never die from cannabis. You might get hurt by the stuff that grows on it, but only if you're immunocompromised. There's stuff called aspergillus on there, and occasionally some of these other bugs can show up at a very rare rate. Probably not a big deal unless you're sick or unless you have epilepsy, but nevertheless, it's mandated in most places that these get tested for, and we've got the fastest platform for doing it. The way people are traditionally doing it is what was invented 100 years ago is putting petri stuff on petri dishes and it's all security theater, it's meaningless. Uh, one, only 1% one of the microbes actually grow in this stuff and the, harmf the really harmful ones don't grow. So we ended up uh, building a quantitative PCR system that just amplifies the DNA of these organisms and you get an answer in a couple hours and uh, you're, you're off to the races and you can get cannabis to market much faster. Speaking of the cannabis market, um, there's a problem in the cannabis market and nobody believes what they're getting. You can go to a dispensary, you're gonna find everything's about 10 bucks a gram. You go to a liquor store, you're gonna find $500 bottles of wine and $5 bottles of wine. Why is that? The reason that is, is that everything is like handwritten on Ziploc bags and is bullshit. And if you ever hear anything or read anything about this problem and someone says they're giving you a sativa or an indica, they're full of shit. We have, we have sequenced enough of these genomes to now know that that, meaning, that, that that nomenclature is complete garbage, it means nothing, and it's basically what this paper describes, the reception and detection of pseudo-profound bullshit. Encourage everyone to read it, it describes the cannabis field beautifully. So we're, we're changing that by sequencing all these things and making ourselves a blockchain of cannabis genomes so that people can actually figure out which strain they have. And this could turn into a really nice seed to sale tracking system and who knows, maybe someone will tokenize it and ICO it. Uh, we don't do that, but uh, that could, uh, there we go. I'm working with Matt, all right? He's gonna help us out. Uh, there's a variety of different ways we sequence genomes. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the great, the, those details, uh, but I do want you to see this video and I'm gonna run down here and give it a little, uh, little go. So this is Canopedia. This is basically a, a blockchain-based registration for the cannabis genomes we've sequenced. Uh, we basically just hash and stash the DNA sequence data and sometimes the other information on it. This is a phylogenetic tree of all the strains and it's color coded based on their genetic proximity. So the red ones are clones, the actual orange ones are siblings, the yellow ones are uh, further away. It's Roy G. Biv order, okay? And so when you get to blue and green, they're really far apart. 
So this is a genetics LinkedIn for growers. They want to breed with something that's really far away. They can check on here to see, all right, those are all clones. Those are all bullshit blue dreams over there because the blue dream uh, cluster has been just counterfeited more than any other strain out there. Uh, so you'll find them all over the place, but really most of the blue dreams are down here. Uh, and then we can do this um, in pop-up websites, a certification website that shows everybody their strain, what their name is, how polymorphic it is, the cannabinoid content, if it's really inbred or outbred, this is the level of heterozygosity, that's really important for the growers to get the thing stable. And then every other strain that's really close to it, and every other strain that's really far away from it. So that if you need to breed far away, you know how to do that. If you need to breed something really close, you know how to do that. And towards the end, we put a little QR code that you can put on your products and some links to the hash and stash that we do in the blockchain. So this is really uh, an effective way for folks to really know whether strains are the same state to state, which right now is really difficult to do. And if you're patient, um, you probably need to know that. Right? I do have control. So um, this is a problem that's occurring right now. Cannabis patents are flooding into the marketplace. You can't trademark cannabis, but you can patent it. It's, a, it's an irony that no one will really resolve at the USPTO for you. So um, what do we do about this? Some of these are really broad claims. Look at this, a new and distinct cultivar of cannabis plant as shown and described. You gotta read like 30 pages to figure out what that is. Other very, very broad terms as well, or claims as well. So if you are doing this hashing and stashing on the blockchain, you're actually creating prior art, okay? You're creating what's known as a prior use exemption in the US patent code, and that can prevent these people from knocking on your door and being trolls. We did do this many years ago. In 2011, we put one cult of our public, which was ChemDog. Actually, we put LA Confidential public as well. Those are high THC strains, so those are probably in the clear. But the ones that make CBD aren't, and they're starting to get some protection. Um, there's a handful of ways we do the sequencing that I won't dive into too much detail here, but we're not sequencing whole genomes most of the time. We're sequencing about 1% of the genome or less, 3.2 million bases. And we tend to sequence this pathway, which makes the cannabinoids and, and the terpenes. And then we sequence a bunch of other regions that help us um, Rosetta Stone this into everything else that's been sequenced before so we can, uh, we can really prove whether something's unique. And then, of course, we blockchain integrate it. Once you have this information, what you can then do is sort these variants to find out the ones that give you the most signature. And uh, that's important because if you don't want to read the entire genome to figure out if something has been swapped in a dispensary, uh, you just need to read 30 letters to basically make yourself a little barcode. That's about what we're finding, is about 29 single nucleotide polymorphisms can pinpoint anything on this tree, and that's a very small unit of information that we can measure. Not too far from a Bitcoin address, actually, which is kind of interesting. Um, so um, that's important if you're growing something like this. I was just up at this place. This is 70,000 square feet of cannabis being grown, and behind that wall is a million square feet getting built. That gets built at about $100 a square foot, and there's about 10 of these being built in Canada right now. So naturally, tracking this stuff can be a real mess. It can get crossed and, and mixed up. And many of the regulatory agencies are demanding products have to get built with the same strain. So you got to keep track of your strains. You got to track your, track your cultivars. Uh, and you got to make sure you know where your products came from. So to do that, we designed this little color metric test. Uh, if you only want to measure 30 letters in the genome, you don't need to sequence the whole thing. What you do is you make these, this little assay. It's known as a lamp assay that can amplify at room temperature, actually it's at 65 degrees, but it's isothermal, and you can do this on the space station. They've done it on the space station. Uh, and what happens after this thing amplifies is this, you get a color shift. It changes from pink to yellow. So the first thing we did is we, we figured out the Y chromosome of cannabis so we could figure out males from females because males got to get rid of them. It's, it's like Thelma and Louise on steroids. They kill males faster than they can find them. This helps them find them really fast. Otherwise, they have to sit under lights for six weeks, and it's a big waste of light, of light and space. So uh, first leaf pops out of the ground. We can figure out if it's male or female. And of course, you can run these things off of this little laptop here, and these, you can scale these by just daisy chaining lots of these things together. And it's really cheap. It does eight at a time. It's less than 10 bucks. It works off a hole punch. You get answers in 90 minutes. But the most important thing is you can do it on site. You're no longer shipping plant matter or DNA over state lines. DNA is legal to go across state lines, but plant matter isn't. Uh, but this keeps your DNA in-house, so you don't have to worry about the lab that's running your testing, running off and patenting your, your, your plants, which I think is actually happening right now. Um, so we then went on to build other tests that the growers want, which is how can you, dis or can you discern genetically whether or not something makes CBD or THC? Anyone familiar with CBD and THC in the audience? These are two of the most, yeah, right. Uh, more people know about that than the bases in DNA. I love it. Um, so. Uh, this is, uh, we, we sequenced those regions of the genome and figured out 
how it governs CBD, THC, and CBG. And so we have tests for those things so growers can figure out whether the plants are gonna breed one thing or the other. I already told you about male versus female, and this scales very nicely into these 96 well plates, so you can actually do hundreds to thousands of seeds at a time. Um, this is a little study we did with the Emerald Cup and some folks in Colorado where we went looking for all this, the uh, CBD lines that they have, and we can discern C all these different CBD lines really easily with this test uh, in a field portable manner. So this scales very nicely. For those um, who are familiar with Moore's Law, this is Moore's Law over the last Oh, was that, that 15 years, this is the cost of sequencing over the last 15 years. Part of this inflection curve, this point here, is when that sequencer that we built that was 100,000 times faster turned out to actually be 100,000 times faster. Uh, and uh, ABI pumped a lot of money into it, but also two other companies came out with competing technologies that were just as fast, and it's really competition that drove this thing down. Um, and so uh, it, it captured about 35% market share, and I don't think it's used very much anymore, but Illumina is pretty much dominating it at this point of time. But the, the important point is just like Bitcoin was able to jump and leapfrog up Moore's law going from CPUs to GPUs to ASICs, we can do the same thing with genomics. We've been through this before with the Human Genome Project. If we need to micro, use microfluidics and nanofluidics, those are very easy steps for us to make. So this little test is in 25 microliters, it's 20 microliters in 96 well plates, it moves to 10 microliters in 3D4, and we're already playing around with 15, 36 wells. Why am I telling you this? because this means we can take those 30 SNPs and make them the cost of about three. So we can actually do this very affordably in the field, pinpoint what strain it is and what those other genetic markers are for very scalable costs. And hopefully, eventually, we'll have iPhones that'll take pictures of this and tell you where it is in Canopedia. So while you're at that, you might as well measure the other things that might hurt you, because uh, we can make assays that pick up the nasty bugs and then we should go about and find every single thing that's ever killed cannabis, sequence its genome, and make tests for those. So this little bugger over here, powdery mildew, we sequenced that genome last November. Uh, this has killed probably 50-fold more cannabis than the DEA. Uh, it is the number one pest in cannabis. Uh, we now have its genome, we now have tests to pick it up, and we can select for whether plants that actually uh, are resistant to it with these tests. And then we went on to sequence the russet mite genome. Botrytis was done before at the Broad, and then Fusarium and Pythium. There's a whole list of these we're, we're running through. And we're making these little colorimetric tests that growers can then screen for any material going into these things, uh, or into these grows, uh, that might kill their, kill their plants. Um, very important for grows, if they don't have crop insurance, they can't let anything into those grows, because they're all monocultures. And this is some of that in action of powdery mildew, and it turns a really bright yellow if there's powdery mildew present. Uh, and these are a couple other um, tests that we did with various labs. And, uh, and this is the last uh, little point I'll show you, is that once you start doing a lot of these things, um, you want to be able to do them. Well, actually, you don't want to do them. You want someone else to do them. You want a robot to do them. Because, uh, let me see, did I get that right? These robots. Um, because robots are cool, right? The robots are going to come take all of our jobs. That's what we need to have happen right now is, uh, oh, it's asking me to hide it. That's being a little bit, uh, righty, let me see. Maybe this one isn't going to work. But what this is here is an OpenTrons uh, robot that uh, is an open architecture, but it's only 4K. And I'm not having luck getting it to, getting it to cooperate, but... What do you think? Right there, it's supposed to play it, but it's popping up that other little thing. Uh, that I may have just had a really unfortunate placement of that little uh, little clicker there. But all right, well, if you were to look at this, you can see it online. This is basically a liquid handling robot that looks like a 3D printer. It's 4K. It's light. You can pick it up. You can throw it in your trunk. You can drive it to a grow, and you can actually have this thing set up these little pink reactions for you. Uh, and this helps you scale it uh, very readily so that you can get a couple hundred of these plates done. Not 100 plates. I would say probably 300, uh, 300 assays in an hour it'll pound through. And uh, this is really helpful for these people to get on board and not have to bipedal all these things by hand. Um, so. Um, more or less in summary, we think 30 SNPs can identify most of the cannabis origin out there, and this can become in the future, I'm not going to say that we can do this today, but we do see a seed to sale genetic blockchain emerging out of this. We, sh we need open architecture on this. We need to have a blockchain that can track all these things. We want all the safety tests to be in that blockchain so people's cannabis can be assured to be what it is. 
Um, but while we're at it, we can also build these portable decentralized tools that will give us plant fingerprints, male, female, know what type of chemotype it's going to be, and then screen for powdery mildew and all these other things that can kill the plant. And in the future, we'll probably look at uh, other terpene markers and microbial risks. And if you want to learn more about this, come to CanMed. It's going to be next year, October 21st. It's about 1,500 people that are expected to go here. This is a cannabinoid, mostly medical cannabinoid conference, 30% physicians, there's CME credits, and we are going going to have a blockchain track there because this field needs to have blockchain speakers. Uh, so if you're interested, stay in touch with me. Um, this should be, it should not conflict with this meeting next year. So uh, it's just the week before. And I think with that, I'm out of time and I want to make sure all these people are recognized for their great hard work and I'll take questions. So I uh, appreciate the talk. Thank you. A fair amount of it is kind of over my head. I'm a very untechnical person. But my only question is, if you're dealing with all these growers, do you have a side entry into them being able to buy a coin or something to get their money into the Bitcoin system as opposed to not dealing with banks and keeping it under their mattresses? So uh, that's a great question. We are not right now in the business of making ICOs or tokens or coins that might facilitate that. There's a the variety of ICOs out there doing it. Um, we're the way we we're a Reg D company, so we've been invested in a Reg D manner. We're not touching the plant. We are selling picks and shovels into the field, and those picks and shovels you can there's there's um, guidance with a coal memo on how you need to know your customer in that and, and how you need to do the AML to receive cash from any of these businesses. A lot of them are in, are in Canada. They're traded publicly on the Canada and the Canadian exchange, and so there is some regulatory oversight, but we are not in the business of actually touching the plan. I think there's, oh, there uh, we go, Matt, please. Yeah. Um, so I guess I missed the beginning of the talk. Are you fundraising? This is like, uh, this is the first time I've seen this in depth. I've seen your talk a couple of times. Are you fundraising? How are you doing this? How are you building all of this? Are you just doing it and open sourcing everything? How are you going to fund all this and can people invest? Okay, so um, good news and bad news. Uh, oh, so the, the answer to your question is we just had an oversubscribe round. We're doing the traditional way with a Reg D investment and uh, it, it is a convertible debt offering which implies there's probably going to be a, dis there is a discount into a potential future round. We just don't know when that's going to be. Right now, we're, we're the, the, the sales are growing strong enough that we if we may not need a second round, but we may take it anyway to try and build that blockchain concept. Yeah, we need your help. <laughs> so, so we should talk afterwards because uh, we're familiar with the Reg D space. We're not as familiar with the legalities of this. And this being cannabis, we have to do it, you know, straight and narrow with the SEC. All right. I'll go uh, back. Hey, how's it going, Kevin? Um, you said about uh, the indica and sativas are not really like they're kind of crap. Like when they say that, um, do they really know like the THC levels and like the CBD levels and like all that, or is that kind of so um, genetically? When you try and find, um, if you notice that phylogenetic tree did not have like two distinct clusters, right? And that is because we have been interbreeding those two strains. If they were subspecies, they've been interbred for so long that they're now intermixed. And the nomenclature you see in leafly these other places claiming something's 10% sativa and 90%, there's no scientific basis for that. That is all folklore. Um, it, likewise, I don't think that information, people have tried to run PCA analysis to see if those names give you any indication of the chemotype, like whether it's THC or CBD, no correlation there either. So um, we think the whole thing needs to be redone. Uh, and this kind of distributed consensus where we sequence everything with people's anticipated names and let the genetics sort it out is the only way to really give you confidence in what your chemotype is gonna be. Uh, we have time for uh, one more question. Does anybody else have a question? Yes, okay. As a formal biological engineer, I thank you for this presentation, but what is your current adoption rate? Okay, so um, there was a, gra a graph in there that showed customer growth rate, um, and we probably really started selling most of these things in April, although we've had the microbial stuff out there for more than a year. So we are the leading microbial testing reagent in the, in the field right now. We've probably got over 80 different labs using it. Um, and we're just starting to get the grows uh, taken on. That chart up there, every one of those strains was a customer strain, spent about five or 600 bucks per strain. 
Okay, on that note, um, that, that was great. Did you want to take any other questions outside? Because we'll Absolutely. put, your hands, put you. your hands together for Kevin. Thank you.